These last few sessions have been about establishing a cost of financing, a cost of capital for a business. And most analysts spend the substantial amount of the valuation time estimating a cost of capital or discount rates. But here's a harsh reality. When you're going to mess up an evaluation, I'm not suggesting that's a good objective, it's because you get the cash flows wrong. In this session, we're going to lay out how best to estimate cash flows in four steps. We're going to start with accounting earnings and tweak it to get a better measure of what it's supposed to measure. We're going to look at how much of those earnings have to go to pay taxes, how much of those earnings have to be set aside to cover reinvestment for future growth, and finally, if you're estimating cash flows to equity, how much of those cash flows have to be used to service debt. That is essentially the four-step process we will spend this session talking about. These last few sessions, we've talked about how best to estimate the discount rate, the cost of equity or the cost of capital for a company. Now I want to shift the focus to what's in the numerator, the expected cash flows. And here's why. When you make a mess in evaluation, it's not usually because you got the discount rate wrong, it's because you got the cash flows wrong. So the first thing you need to do when your job is to estimate cash flows is to decide who you're estimating the cash flows to. Now that might sound mysterious, but remember, there are two ways you can estimate cash flows. One is cash flows to equity investors, which are cash flows left over after debt payments. The other is the cash flow to the entire business. If you think about cash flows to equity investors, those can be estimated in multiple ways as well. The simplest and the oldest way of estimating cash flows to equity investors is to look at what they get in dividends. That, of course, is the old dividend discount model. A slightly more augmented version of dividends is to include stock buybacks, especially with the U.S. companies which pay back a lot of their money in stock buybacks rather than dividends. Think of that as augmented dividends. But there's a third way that we'll talk about to estimate cash flows to equity investors, which is to estimate potential dividends, what a company could have paid out rather than what it actually paid out. Essentially, we're going to estimate how much cash is left over after every other conceivable need has been met. Those are all cash flows to equity. There's always the cash flow to the entire business where you're looking at pre-debt cash flows. To estimate those cash flows, you're going to start with operating income, not net income, because you don't want to subtract out interest expenses. You're going to act like you pay taxes on the operating income. Keyword is act. And then you're going to subtract out reinvestment needs to come up with cash flows to the entire business. So let's lay out the pathways to get to cash flows. And essentially, there are three steps involved here. The first step is earnings. Accounting earnings are the net income for equity investors or operating income. If that number is wrong, obviously everything else is going to be wrong as well. So let's make sure we get that starting number right. Second step in the process is we've got to estimate how much of those earnings are going to get reinvested back into the business to generate future growth. That's a discretionary choice. Companies can choose to reinvest. They can choose not to reinvest. So when you look at a company, you're looking at what they're choosing to do. And the third step, and this applies if you're looking at cash flows to equity, is you look at the cash flows to debt, debt holders, which is interest and principal payments, and cash flows from debt holders. What do I mean by that? When you borrow money, cash comes into the business. If you're an equity investor, you've got to count that cash flow as well. So the first step, of course, is earnings. And let me lay out three things that I always do when I look at the accounting earnings for a company. First, I'm valuing the company as of today not as of January 1st of 2012, 2011, not some day in the past, but today. So I want to get the most updated earnings I can as of right now. That's kind of tough to do because accountants don't update earnings every day. But I'm going to try to get the most updated earnings. And for U.S. companies, that almost always requires me to use what are called trailing 12-month earnings. Sounds fancy, right? But all I do is take the last four quarters, bundle them together, and create my own version of the most recent financial year. Rather than use the last annual report, a 10K, which might be six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months old, I'd rather use more, more updated numbers. In fact, I'll go further. Even when I'm in markets where everything doesn't get updated every quarter, I will take what I can. In other words, I will update the numbers I can and leave the numbers that I cannot update either un untouched or make my best estimates I'd rather have updated numbers than dated numbers. And the younger the company and the more growth it has, the more critical it is that you update the numbers. Second step in the process, I'm going to try to normalize. Again, sounds fancy. But if you have a commodity company or a cyclical company, 
looking at the most recent year can be misleading. It could be a great year, it could be a terrible year. Why? Because commodity prices go up and down and economies go through cycles. You go through recessions, you go through booms. Use common sense. When you're valuing a commodity or a cyclical company, look at what the company can make in a normal year. I'm not saying that's going to be easy to estimate, but it's something you have to try to estimate. And there's a third step in the process that's a little involved. Accountants are not always consistent about how they categorize expenses. And in a sense, you've got to reverse some of their mistakes. In particular, there are two items that I routinely recategorize in income statements. The first is leases. Retail firms, restaurants, and other businesses often lease their assets. And when they lease their assets, accountants sometimes give them a choice. If their lease doesn't give rise to ownership rights, which is how accountants used to categorize leases, those leases are treated as operating leases. And operating leases are treated as operating expenses. The bulk of the leases that retailers have are categorized as operating leases. So they show up as operating expenses. But many of these leases are, many, are multi-year lease commitments, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. And if you look at the footnotes to the financial statements for most retail firms, most restaurants, you'd see a set of lease commitments going out into the future. U.S. companies, for instance, have to break down their lease commitments for the next five years, and beyond year five, they have to give you a lump sum. These are not expected lease payments. These are contractual commitments that these comp companies have entered into already. And from my perspective, that's debt. You've entered into a contractual commitment. You've got to meet in good times and bad times. I'm going to treat it as debt. So I've got to reverse leases from operating expenses to financial expenses, and it's really not difficult to do. What I essentially have to do is take the present value of those lease commitments from that table and discount them back to today using the pre-tax cost of debt as my discount rate. Why pre-tax cost of debt? Because those lease commitments are pre-tax commitments. So let me give you an example. This is the Gap in 2003. The Gap is a retail firm. It has dozens, hundreds of lease commitments. In fact, pretty much every store that you see, which is a Gap store, is under a lease. So I've pulled the commitments out of the financial statements, and I'm discounting those commitments back to the present using a 6% discount rate. 6% is my estimate of the pre-tax cost of debt for the gap in 2003. When you take the present value of the commitments, which is what I've done, the one troublesome aspect to deal with is what to do about that lump sum commitment after year five. Note that that commitment is not a commitment for year six, it's actually a commitment for everything beyond year six. Make your best judgment. Here's what I do. I take the average lease commitment over the first five years. That's simple enough to do, right? I look at the lump sum commitment in year six. So as an example, if the average lease commitment for the first five years is $200 million and the lump sum commitment in year six is a billion, that looks to me like a five-year lease commitment. Basically, I'm taking the billion, looking at the $200 million, and treating it as a five-year commitment. It's a little tweak, but I think it gives you a better estimate of the present value of those lease commitments. If you take the present value of those lease commitments for a company like The Gap, you're going to see the dollar debt that you report for this company double, quadruple, go up fivefold. And that's a much truer sense of what this company really has outstanding as debt. Now, let me follow through on this. Why do I care how much debt a company has? There are a couple of reasons why I convert operating lease commitments to debt. The first is to get a better sense of how much debt this company owes and what its true cost to capital is. And in most cases, when you capitalize lease commitments, you're going to increase your debt ratio. You're actually going to lower your cost of capital. Second step. Remember when you capitalize leases, you're go going to move the lease expense from an operating expense to a capital expense. There are consequences. When you treat something as a capital expense, you create an asset. Assets create depreciation. So when I decide to move leases from operating to, capital, uh, to, to financial expenses, I actually have to restate my operating income by adding back the lease expense and subtracting out the depreciation that I've had on that leased asset. Sounds messy, but it's a pretty straightforward process. And if you do it every single time, it's going to get easier every time you do it. In the case of the gap, notice a couple of things. By capitalizing leases, I increase their operating income. That's good, right? By capitalizing leases, I increase their debt ratio and lower their cost of capital. That's good too. 
Now, before you start celebrating, though, there's a third consequence from capitalizing leases. When you capitalize leases, it becomes part of your invested capital. When it becomes part of your invested capital, it affects your return on capital. In the case of The Gap, and for many retail firms, you're going to see the return on invested capital at this firm drop when you capitalize leases. That is going to have consequences for how much value you attach to the company. The net effect can be positive for some companies, neutral for some, and negative for some, depending upon what happens to the return on capital of the company relative to the cost of capital. In the case of the gap, for instance, the spread between the return on capital and the cost of capital decreases when I capitalize leases. And as a consequence, when I value the gap with leases treated as debt, which I think is the right thing to do, I'm going to get a lower value, but a more realistic value for the company. So anytime you have a contractual commitment, it might not just be leases, treat it as debt. Carry it through to its logical consequences. Here's a second item that you might have to, to do some adjusting for. Accountants, when they look at R&D, basically treat it as an operating expense. But R&D is really a capital expense. Step back. A capital expense is an expense designed to create benefits over many periods, right? And what company in its right mind does R&D expecting to get a benefit this year? So my first inclination with R&D is to treat it as a capital expense. And again, there are consequences. If I decide to treat R&D as a capital expense, I can't just start doing it this year. I need to go back in time and do it over previous years. What does that mean? Well, I have to capitalize R&D from five years ago, four years ago, three years ago. And when you capitalize an expense, remember you have to amortize or depreciate that expense and have to keep track of that as well. Again, it sounds messy, but to capitalize R&D, here's the three-step process you need to go through. First step, you need to give me an amortizable life for the R&D. You're saying, what the heck is that? Well, when you do R&D, you're not going to get a benefit right away. You've got to tell me, on average, how long it takes you between the time you do R&D and a commercial product emerges from that R&D. Notice I said on average. It could take five years. It could take three years. It could take 15. Some R&D might not pay off, but on average, how long does it take? Once you give me the answer to that question, then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. What were your R&D expenses each year for that amortizable life going back in time? The third step is purely mechanical. Here's what you need to do. Once you give me the amortizable life, I've got to write off the R&D over that period. So if you tell me, for instance, that your R&D has a five-year life, I'm going to write off one-fifth each year. I'm going to keep track of two numbers. I'm going to tr keep track of how much you're writing off this year. That's the amortization this year and how much is still left over. Sounds abstract, right? So let's take an example. This is the German technology company, SAP. I'm going to try to capitalize r and I'm going to assume it has a five-year life. Now, five years is not an unreasonably long period, but 10 years is what I use for pharmaceutical companies. I might use three for some technology companies, but here I've used five. I've collected the R&D expenses each year for the last five. I'm writing off one-fifth each year, so the R&D expense from five years ago, the last one-fifth is written off, and I'm keeping track of how much is left over. The R&D from five years ago, there's nothing left over. I've written it all off. Four years ago, I write off one-fifth. I have one-fifth left over. Three years ago, I write off one-fifth. There's two-fifths left over. So if you look at the last two columns on this page, the last column actually gives you the amortization from this year. It's the amount of R&D from prior years that I'm writing off this year. The second to last column, if you sum it up, gives me the value of the R&D that I've invested in, or for lack of a better term, the capital I've invested in R&D. You might say again, why, would, why do we go through these steps? Again, there are consequences, and here are the consequences. When I do this for SAP, let me trace through the effects. My operating income now is going to be different. Why? Because I'm going to add back the R&D expense, which was, which was expense before, because it's now a capital expense, and I'm going to subtract out the depreciation on the R&D. In the case of SAP, that increases my operating income. That doesn't always have to be the case. My cost to capital doesn't change, but including that unamortized portion of R&D in my capital changes my return on capital. Again, the net effect can be positive, negative, or neutral. As an example of a positive effect, take a look at this table. This is a valuation I did of Amgen. In my initial, the first column, you see my valuation of Amgen, trusting the accountants, treating R&D as an operating expense, and computing everything based on that premise. I get a value of about $43. In the second column, you see my valuation of, Am of Amgen, 
with R&D capitalized, different return on capital, different growth rates, the net effect is an increase in value per share of almost $31. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, that's Amgen. You tried this for Merck, you might get a very different answer. Your value might actually decrease. What we're doing when we capitalize R&D is we hold it up to the same standards we do any other investment. There's nothing inherently good or bad about investing in R&D. If you're a commercial enterprise, the benefits of R&D ultimately have to show up in your earnings, and I'm holding these companies up to that standard. So that's getting the earnings right. But once you get the earnings right, here's the second step, is you need to compute the taxes that you would pay on that operating income, right? Well, that should be pretty simple if you have a tax rate. And there are two choices you have here. One is your effective tax rate, which for lack of a better term is like an average tax rate you pay across all of your income. The other is the marginal tax rate. That is the tax rate on your last dollar of income. As an example, in 2013, the marginal tax rate for U.S. corporations was roughly 40% for their U.S. income. The average effective tax rate was closer to 28 or 29%. Most companies have effective tax rates lower than the marginal tax rate. So big question when you compute your after-tax operating income is which tax rate to use. If you go to the marginal tax rate right off the top, you're going to lower your cash flows. But I think you might be too conservative because you're essentially assuming that all of your income starting tomorrow will get taxed at that marginal tax rate. If you stay with the effective tax rate in perpetuity, you might be in trouble for a different reason. You might not be paying enough in taxes because those deferred taxes, the taxes that you're holding back on, eventually have to get paid. So here's one way I split the difference. I start with the effective tax rates. So in years one, two, and three, if I want to use 28%, I feel okay using 28%. But as I move out towards year five, year six, year eight, I will start moving the tax rate towards my marginal tax rate. Maybe I'm being too conservative, but I'd rather be too conservative on this issue they're not conservative enough. Third step in the process is I need to subtract out reinvestment. Again, the accounting words that get, go into the reinvestment can be misleading. Capital expenditures minus depreciation is net capex, change in working capital. Looks at the investment in short-term assets. The accounting definitions are a little crimped, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to expand the definition of capex to include not just R&D, we just talked about how that was capital expenditure, but also acquisitions. Companies like Cisco that grow consistently through acquisitions, I have to count the cost of those acquisitions as part of my net capex. If I want to count the good stuff from, that comes from acquisitions, I have to count the bad stuff as well. When it comes to working capital, the accounting definition of working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. I'm going to modify the definition a little bit. I'm going to use non-debt current liabilities because short-term debt to me is part of debt in my cost of capital. And I'm not going to include cash in my current assets. Why? Because cash is not a wasting asset as far as I'm concerned. It's not a wasting asset because most cash is invested at a fair market rate. Commercial paper, T-bills, you might earn a low rate of return, but you're earning a fair rate of return. In other words, if you or I invest in something liquid and riskless, we'd earn roughly the same rate of return. So slight modifications, but they can make a big difference in your final numbers. Last step in the process, if you have to do free cash flow equity, you have to net out the cash flows from debt and to debt. Cash flows to debt will be interest and principal payments. Cash flows from debt will be new debt that you take on. So free cash flow equity is my generic measure of potential dividends. It starts with net income, so interest expenses are taken out. You still subtract out net capex and change in working capital. The reinvestment you subtract out to get to cash flow to the firm. But you now also subtract out the net cash flow from new debt issues netted out against debt repayments. That'll be your cash flow equity. So in summary, cash flows matter. Pay some attention to the details. There are lots of potholes in the computation of cash flows, and it's good to be able to know how to avoid them.